نحمده و نسلی و نسلم على رسوله الكريم و على آله و أصحابه و من تبعهم بإحسان إلى يوم الدين فقد قال الله تبارك وتعالى في القرآن الكريم والفرقان الحميد أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم وإن كنتم جنوبا فاتهروا وقال جل وعلا في مقام آخر آخر وثيابك فتهر وقال النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم لا تقبل صلاة بغير تهور وقال النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم التهور شطر الإيمان سرق الله مولانا العظيم وسرق رسوله النبي الكريم ونحن على ذلك من الشاهدين والشاكرين والحمد لله رب العالمين سبحانك لا علم لنا إلا ما علمتنا إنك أنت العليم الحكيم رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وحل الأقدة من لساني يفقه قولي ربنا يسر ولا تعسر وتم بالخير وبك نستعين يا فتاح ربي زدني علما اللهم صل وسلم دائما أبدا على حبيبك خير الخلق كلهم My dear respected brothers and sisters We continue tonight inshallah on the kitab al-salah The chapter of salah We began by mentioning the definition of salah According to the sharia Which is a form of worship Consisting of various acts to be done in a prescribed manner And we spoke about the virtues of salah Thereafter we went on a little tangent On the topic of Babul Adhan And we spoke about the initiation of the Adhan In the Ummah of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam We spoke about the different methods that were used before The, ad the, the implementation of the Adhan and thereafter we spoke about the ikhtilafat of the wordings of the adhan we mentioned a few masail of the adhan tonight we will continue with regards to the chapter of salah and uh, it mentions here some salah are compulsory fard example the five times daily salah some are incumbent wajib example the witr salah some are commendable masnoon example the salah offered at Tahiyat al-Masjid and some are supererogatory nafil example any nafil salah that we may know about salah we spoke about previously salah became compulsory upon the ummah of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam Laylatul Mi'raj we spoke about a little ikhtilaf that before this the companions used to be performing salah in the morning and also in the evening according to some scholars the scholars have mentioned that tajjud salah was compulsory upon the rasul sallallahu alaihi wasallam but not upon the ummah so the compulsory salah in itself is that which has been made obligatory from allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and we spoke about the five times daily salah this is an example of that which is compulsory Man and woman must perform this salah. Those who have reached the age of puberty, we are coming up to that inshallah. Some salah are incumbent, like the witr salah, that which is wajib. That which is wajib. Imam Abu Hanifa rahmatullahi alayhi is of the opinion that yes, alhamdulillah, thumma alhamdulillah, the five times daily salah is compulsory upon us. And there is another salah that the Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam did not leave off. And he mentioned certain things about it. For example, he said that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has increased for you in this particular salah. That is the witr salah. And witr salah is wajib. When we speak about wajib, it's a slight difference between that which is fard. Now some of the other scholars are of the opinion It can only be farz or it can be sunnah It cannot be in between the two Imam Abu Hanifa rahmatullahi alayhi That is the view of Imam Shafi rahmatullahi alayhi Imam Abu Hanifa rahmatullahi alayhi Has a slightly different view Based upon the traditions of the Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has increased this particular salah Based upon the constancy of the Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam performing it without fail then we understand that this salah is of utmost importance and how the sahabas would have performed the witr salah etc and what he advised of the sahabas with regards to the witr salah 
We had, there are different narrations with regards to the Witr Salah, we will mention briefly, inshallah. The Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said that we should make the Witr Salah the last Salah of the night. And even in the book of Hidayah, it mentions for those people who, mashallah, alhamdulillah, they are continuous and they are habitual for waking up for the night Salah, it is good. It is good that they perform the Isha Salah, the Witr Salah, sorry, at the last portion of the night. We will come to the timings of Salah, inshallah. Uh, but for now, we are just speaking about the Salah in itself. So we spoke about the five times daily Salah, that is compulsory. Fajr, the two Fars of Fajr. And as we know, we have Sunnah of Fajr, and then we have the Fars of Fajr. For Dhuhr, four Sunnah, four Farud, two Sunnah, two Nafil. For Asr, four Sunnah, four Farud. So um, Maghrib, three Farud, two Sunnah, two Nafil. For Isha, we have four Sunnah, four Fard, two Sunnah, two Nafil, three Witr, and according to some, two Nafil, and according to some, that has been abrogated. We are speaking about specifically for now, the Witr Salah. And some, the Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, to show its importance, he Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, when he was performing the Tahajjud Salah, he would not wake up his wife or his wives to perform that. But he would wake them up to perform the Witr Salah. And this is, these are some of the Dalils whereby the Hanafi jurists are of the opinion that you perform the, the Witr Salah is wajib. And it is essential to be performed. It does not on any account, my dear respected brothers and sisters, mean that the other Imma of the opinion that it is not considered at all or there is no emphasis on it. Yes, they are very much of the opinion that a person must perform the, the, the witr salah and a person should do it. The Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam did it in constancy without fail. And that is, a that is a sign of emphasis. That is a sign of emphasis. So there were some companions who used to leave this witr salah until they woke up in the morning for the tahajjud prayer. So if a person is habitual like that, no problem. They can perform their sunnah salawat. A, the tahajjud salah, qiyamul layl as the case may be, then perform the witr salah. This is wajib. And those people who may be a little worried that, you know, probably they worked hard, probably they were tired the night, and they are not sure they will wake up at that hour of the morning, it is best that the, they perform the witr salah before they go to sleep. Otherwise, even according to Ahnaf, we have to make qadha. We have to make qadha of the witr salah if we have missed it in the night. Even if we didn't miss the farz, we perform the farz, we perform the sunnah. Then we tell ourselves, inshallah, later on at night, we will in the morning, in the wee hours of the morning, we will perform the witr salah. And we didn't get to do so. When dawn breaks, we can still perform the witr salah at that time. Of course, it will be as qadha. So this is what is known as wajib salah. This is what is known as wajib salah, the witr salah. Fard is that which has been established decisively, mutawatiran. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has mentioned it in the Holy Quran, wa aqimu salah as we have mentioned. And now we are explaining there are different categories of salah that we can perform. The farz, yes, alhamdulillah, when we do that, the burden and the sin will come off of us. And we even we, we, are, we will come to see with regards to the commendable salah, masnoon, for example, tahiyatul masjid. There are different salawat that the Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he would perform them constantly and sometimes he will not perform them. How another angle we know about how these salah are emphasized is that sometimes we knew how Islam started and we spoke about that a little bit. When initially when the law started to come in, people will come from different places and the sahabas would ask and question the Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So some people when they came from far off and they, they saw the Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, they met him. Sometimes he would tell them about doing a particular thing. So for example, sometimes you see a hadith of the Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and it mentions about four out of the five pillars of Islam. Sometimes it is like that. 
Sometimes the Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam would teach a certain companion about deen. But he wouldn't tell him everything because it is one majlis. The, the, the companions would come and say, Oh Messenger of Allah, we have come from far and we have left people behind us. So therefore, we want to learn something from you and take it back to them. So if the Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam emphasized upon a particular point and he did not leave it out for any particular sahabas, the sahabas would be given an indication that you know what? This is not to be left out. This seems like something that is, it is strict. We have to do it, right? And that is like fard, sunnatun mu'akkada or wajib. We are coming up to the sunnah inshallah. But I think we have a gist with regards to the witr salah being wajib. According to Ahnaf, it is something that must be performed and it is performed after the Isha salah. A, we Ahnaf, Imam Abu Hanifa, Rahmatullahi alayhi and Hanafi jurists do not say that there are six timings for that particular, for the day. No, we have five timings in a day. But witr salah has the same timing of the Isha salah with the condition that we perform the Isha Salah firstly. We cannot stand up at home, pray Witr Salah, and then come to the Masjid and perform Farz of Isha. If we do that knowingly, we will have to repeat over the Isha Salah. So the timing of that is like the Isha Salah, but it does not change the command of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It is only on account of the Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. We, the, the Hanafi jurists, have considered that this Salah is wajib, because of the statements, the emphasis that the Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam has laid upon this particular salah. So we have far salah, wajib salah, as the witr salah. Then we have commendable salah, masnoon. As we mentioned, tahiyatul masjid. Many different sunnah salah. The, the salah, that, salawah that we have mentioned just now, with regards to the two sunnah before the fajr, Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he never used to miss out this two sunnah of fajr, hadharan wa safaran. Whether on journey, safaran wa hadharan, whether on journey or whether he was at home, he would always perform this two sunnah, these two sunnah of fajr. Therefore, it has earned the title of being sunnatul mu'akkada, an emphasized sunnah, an emphasized sunnah. There are some sunnah of the Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, wherein he was not always constant. They are known as sunnatun ghayru mu'akkada, like the four sunnah before the asr salah. Give and take, my dear respected brothers and sisters. Sometimes there are different riwayats with regards to how many salawat the Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam performed before a particular salah or after the particular salah. And this is how we get the salah chat with four, 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 two, two, four, four for the asr salah, four and it, sometimes it is upon ikhtilaf. Sometimes you will see another tradition that the Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam performed two two as, a perform, as opposed to four in all. Nevertheless, the Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, what the ulama have deduced, deduced, it is surely from the sunnah of the Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and we can feel confident, mashallah, that even these charts that we, are, we, are, we just learned without knowing their dalils, there is some basis from it from the Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and these things are not upon any ijtihad or any thought of any, in, or any mujtahideen or any scholars after the Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam these salawat would have been performed by the Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam so that is why you get sunnatan mu'akkada and sunnatan ghayru mu'akkada if he never left it, hardly ever left it out illa qalila, accepting a little amount then it became sunnatan mu'akkada if he left it out Time and time again, it would be sunnatun ghayru mu'akkada. Tahiyatul masjid, the Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, in a hadith he mentions, when a person comes to the masjid, then they should show that type of tahiyya, that type of greeting, it is a type of honor to the masjid. And when we enter into the masjid, it is mustahab to perform two rakats of salah. And the Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam told other companions that they should not sit until they perform these two rakats of salah, they are sunnah. So therefore, if we come into the masjid and we, adhan has already been called, if we perform the four sunnah of Asia, for example, then we will also, we can also have the intention of tahiyatul masjid and that will be fulfilled. Why? Because the, the salah 
itself is not the particular item or specific item. A tahiyatul masjid in itself. But as long as we perform any salah, we can have that intention for nafil salah. We can have the intention if it's nafil salah and sunnah salah, mustahab salah. We can have intention for salat, for different types of salawat. Right? Tahiyatul wudu. Right? There was one sahabi, the Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he heard, he, he, um, he heard his footsteps in Jannah and the Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam asked him, what particular amal is it that you practice upon? He said, I don't think I do anything special, O Messenger of Allah, except that when I perform wudu, every time I perform wudu, I perform to rakat of salah. So that is tahiyatul wudu. So when we perform our sunnah salawat, we can have these different, especially nafil salah, we can have these different types of intentions. Not for salah, of course. For salah, it can be only the intention of for salah. For salah can only be the intention of for salah. Some are supererogatory, nafil, optional salah. If as long as it is not makrutain, I can stand and perform two rakat of nafil for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I can perform two rakat of salat al haja two rakat of salat al ishraq All these are sunnah salawat. And to a lighter extent, those which are lesser in practice from the Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, or there was no any specific mention of it, like as we said, performing two rakats of salah in, in any time, that is jais and permissible at all times, as long as we are not in makru timings. As long as we are not in makru timings. To show respect and honor, we perform tahiyatul masjid. And this is why when we go... In the, around the Holy Kaaba, you have Tawaful Qadum. Tawaf takes the place of Tahiyatul Masjid there because Tawaf is reverence at that place. But in all the other Masajid, we don't do Tawaf, so we perform Tahiyatul Masjid. Salah can become compulsory on a, mus a person who is a Muslim, Balig, and Sane. Salah will not become compulsory on a woman during the time she is experiencing haith or nifas. So, Salah is only compulsory upon Muslims. Salah is not compulsory upon non-Muslims. Did we explain that already? We went through this, that paragraph? No? Inshallah. So, salah can become compulsory on a Muslim. So, the strange thing is that, you know, we will give da'wah to non-Muslims, and then, no sooner do they come into the Islam, we tell them, look, you have to pray now. He says, but I don't know how to pray. The Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam taught us all these guidelines. How, how do they pray? Right? In, in the book of Mishkat also, there's the ahadith of the Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam that teaches them, to do tasbih if they do not know Surah al fatiha as yet, they do not know any Quran at all. So the point being here is that a person 10 minutes ago, they are not a Muslim. We are coming to the masjid to perform Aisha Salah, they don't have to come. If we are speaking to them, even giving them da'wah, they are not, it is not compulsory for them to perform any Salah, even Jum'ah. We are giving da'wah, the Adhan for Jum'ah calls, we, go, we head to the masjid. They don't have to head to the masjid because, because Salah is not compulsory upon the non-believers. A salah is compulsory upon believers. Why? We are mukallaf of deen. We are responsible for the umur and affairs of deen. They are not responsible. It doesn't mean they have a free way of life and they will get away with everything. For the people who do not embrace Islam, they will get the fire of hell. But for Muslims who perform their salawat, they will get jannah. Simply because we are working for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We are going through effort for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Right? So, salah is only compulsory upon a Muslim. We cannot compel a non-Muslim to perform salah. This is why even in the time of the Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, in the time of the Khulafa al Rashidun, when those Sahabas and the Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam had non-Muslims living around them, they, and they were paying the jizya, they were not compelled to do anything as the believers. They were not compelled to fast in the month of Ramadan, 
pay the zakah. They would pay jizya, but they would not pay zakah, right? And they would not have to perform salah as the believers would have to perform salah. On the contrary, in an Islamic state, a Muslim can be punished for not performing salah. Balig and Sain. A person also must be Balig has reached the age of puberty in order for salah to be compulsory. Children at a tender age should be encouraged to perform salah. And from the age of seven, they should be commanded to do so. And from the age of ten, they should be beaten lightly to perform salah in order that they acquire the training and habit of performing salah. With regards to becoming Balig, our young children, Alhamdulillah, we train them to perform Salah. And at the age of seven, the Rasul وسلم, he told us that we should command them to perform Salah at the age of ten. At the age of seven, sorry. And at the age of ten, if they do not perform their Salah, they should get a light beating. To perform salah, a eh? for tarbiyah, for tarbiyah, not a beating that would cripple the child, you know, make marks all over their body and so on, and also not such a beating that would cause them to hate Islam and hate performing salah. So it is just a matter of targhib and also a matter of training our children that they have to do the right thing, especially when the parents and the elder ones know what is the best thing for the children. So therefore, we will encourage them to perform salah. And the best encouragement is that وَأْمُرْ أَهْلَكَ بِالصَّلَاةِ وَاسْتَبِرْ عَلَيْهَا Command your family members with salah, but you also be constant upon it. We have to be constant upon it. When we are like that, the children would love to perform salah and we will see that as a reality. If we do not perform salah and we are sitting and watching TV or doing something else, but the, and we are telling the children, go and perform your salah, though you not know the time for salah has come, what type of example are we setting? So, the best example for the children is the elder ones. What we do, the children will love to do. And especially when they are younger, they will run to perform salah with us. When they are babies, alhamdulillah, thumb, alhamdulillah, they will run, jump on our necks, come on our necks when we are in sajda, and take a ride and then come back up when we are in the sitting position. Alhamdulillah, thumb, alhamdulillah. The Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam also, he, he, loved, he loved children. His grandchildren were around him when he was performing salah. At, and it is also very important that we, sh we should be mindful that when we are trying to train our children that they do not disturb other people's salah. And this is something that is neglected in many a masajid. People bring their children and they disturb other people while they are performing salah. We have the responsibility of taking care of our own children. And if we take the responsibility to bring a, a, a child that has sense, then we should ensure that they do the right thing Otherwise, people come to the masjid to perform salah, to concentrate upon Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and they do not get that type of concentration because children are running in and out in front of them, and they are making noise throughout the entire salah. So, we should be mindful of this, inshallah. But we mentioned that a person has to be balig, so we went on that point there with regards to what the Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said. When they are seven, it's not compulsory upon them to perform salah. When they are 10 also, highly unlikely they will have reached the age of puberty. The age of puberty whereby a, person, a boy will get wet dream. It is also possible a girl can get wet dream, right? Their hair starts to grow under their armpit. A boy, he will start to have nocturnal emission. A girl, she will start to see her menses or periods, etc. And different types of things. The beards of the boy start to grow, moustache, etc. So when they reach the age of being balig, no salah is compulsory. If they do not perform any salah, if they do not perform any salah, then they are not accountable when they are not balig. But when they become balig and when they be reach the age of puberty, now they are at the age of ascernment, discernment and now they can know right from wrong. They have the capacity to know right from wrong, so therefore they will be held accountable by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It has been mentioned that in the absence of reaching the age of 15, reaching the age of puberty for a boy or girl, the age of 15 will be considered. Right? The age of 15 will be considered. And a person also has to be seen, a madman, 
does not have to perform salah, right? A madman does not have to perform salah, and uh, you know, sometimes a person will trip occasionally also, they will go mad occasionally, then up at that time, upon that particular individual, salah does not become compulsory. So salah is only compulsory upon the sane people. Muslim, Balik, sane. Salah will not be compulsory upon a woman during the time she is experiencing hive or nifas. Salah will not be compulsory upon a woman during the time she is experiencing hide or nifas. And at the time of the Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, someone asked Hada Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha if they would, they would make qadha of the salah when after they have become clean. And the answer was that the Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam did not command them with the making qadha of salah for after they have achieve their menses. So the woman at the time of the Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam did not perform salah. So this is how we know also a woman in her menses, salah does not become compulsory upon her as opposed to fasting. When a woman is in her menses or after birth bleeding, fasting is compulsory upon her but she cannot, just trying to make it simple inshallah, right, without any technical discussion, Fasting becomes compulsory, but she cannot perform it because she's in a state of menses or she's in a state of after birth bleeding. Therefore, she will have to make cause of it afterwards. She will have to make cause of it afterwards. Just as a male also, sometimes for some reason or the other, we mentioned the battle of the trench. The Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam missed a particular salah. It, salah becomes compulsory. But, and because it became compulsory in itself, after the time goes out, now a person has to make the khadha of that particular salah. So, when a woman is in her menses, salah will not become compulsory. Right? When a woman is in her menses, salah will not become compulsory. On the contrary, fasting will be compulsory. She will have to make khadha of it. Right? And that's, that is what we mean technically, just getting away from a little technical discussion there. Right? It means that the differentiation we are making is that a woman will not have to make the qadha of salah, but she will have to make the qadha of fasting, right? But when she is fasting, she cannot, when she is in her menses, she cannot fast at all, right? So technically speaking, fasting does not become compulsory on her for that particular day, but it will be compulsory upon her with regards to qadha. And that is what I meant, right? So... Salah will not be compulsory upon a woman during the time of menses. And some of the scholars have uh, mentioned that the reason for it is that what? The amount of salawat a woman will have to perform will be a lot. Every month, 7 to 10 days, 3 to 5, 7, 10 days of the month, it could be a lot of salawat that a woman will have to make qadha of. So therefore, alhamdulillah, the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is something that is very easy and a woman does not have to make qadha of that, inshallah. Salah. The compulsion of salah upon a balik person starts from the beginning of the time of that salah and continues until performed at that time. If the salah was not performed in its time, then the compulsion to perform it as qadha will continue until it has perform been performed as qadha. Now, what has been mentioned here, my dear respected brothers and sisters, is that we are coming to the conditions of salah. And we will mention time again there, but because this paragraph is here, we will explain it a bit, inshallah. Salah, we are speaking about salah becoming compulsory upon an individual. But when does salah become compulsory upon an individual when the time for that salah comes in? And when, for example, when does the Maghrib Salah become compulsory? Not in Asr timing. When, in Dhuhr, when we perform the Dhuhr Salah, we could not perform the Asr Salah because Asr Salah did not yet come in. Now, in the Maghrib timing, we can perform Maghrib Salah. Now, we have, for example, 6.16, for example, 6.16 until 7.26 for Maghrib Salah. That is according to the Hanafi jurists. Of course, to pray it at the earlier time is best. To pray it at the earlier time is best. And we will deal with the mustahab timings of salah, inshallah. But salah becomes compulsory. This 
paragraph here is to let us know that Salah, it becomes compulsory over a span of time. Salah does not become compulsory for five minutes. We have from 6.16, let's use another Salah, inshallah, so we'll stay away from the makru timing. So let's say the Har Salah starts from 12.16, and it ends at 4.30, right? 12.16, and it ends at 4.30, for the sake of example. According to the Hanafi jurist, according to Imam Shafi, it would be before that, like 3.30, and Imam Ahmad also. But according to Imam Abu Hanifa, rahmatullahi alayhi, Salah will end, Dhuhr Salah will end at, after two shadows. So, now, we have until 12.15 until 4.30. The question is, at 12.30, must I perform my Dhuhr Salah? Dhuhr Salah has become compulsory, but it is compulsory in a, that is spread out. It is compulsory now, yes. But if I don't perform it at 12.30, I could perform it at 1 o'clock. If I don't perform it at 1 o'clock, I could perform it at 1.30. So this is what, it meant, what is meant that the compulsion of salah, it goes throughout the entire time. Until we perform it in that time, then of course the compulsion is uplifted from ourselves. It will be compulsory until it is performed. If uh, until 4.30 we did not perform this duhar salah, then... Performing it as qadha, which is sinful, which is sinful, still becomes compulsory. So within the time, it is compulsory to perform it within the time. Compulsory, what is the, uh, the, um, the other side of it being compulsory? It means that the jaza, the recompense of it being compulsory, we could either get reward for performing it on time, or we could be punished for not performing it on time, if we do not have a valid reason. And if we do not have a valid reason for not performing it on time, then when the Zuhr time comes out and we perform it as Qadha, we, it is still compulsory upon us, it is essential for us to make the Qadha, but we will be sinful. Why? We did not perform it within the timing. We will now continue with the conditions for the validity of performing Salah. Those conditions... Salah, we have mentioned about what is Salah, the different categories of Salah, Fard, Wajib, etc. Now, we are going to speak about the conditions that precede the Salah. Those things that we have to do in order for us to perform the Salah. There are six conditions that must be fulfilled before performing the actual Salah. If any of these six conditions are not fulfill, is not fulfilled, then the salah will not be valid. One, purification. In order to perform salah, we have, we have to have purification, and we will explain them inshallah. Two, we have to cover our awrah before we perform salah. Three, before we perform salah, we must be facing the direction of the qibla. Four, before we perform salah, the time of that salah must be in. Five, before we perform salah, we must have intention. We must have intention. And six, before we perform the salah and enter into the salah, we must say tahrima, to utter the praise of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, causing all things out of salah to be prohibited, to become prohibited in salah. Right? And we will explain that as we go along, inshallah. We will explain as we go along. So the first one is purification that we will deal with inshallah. Purification, we dealt a lot with that in the chapter of Taharat. Now we will speak about it specifically with regards to the salah and when a, a person wants to perform salah. The removal of ritual impurities from one's body and the removal of visible impurities from one's body, clothes and place of salah, are conditions for the validity of salah. However, in certain circumstances of necessity, one will perform salah with visible impurities. So, it's necessary upon us to purify ourselves from impurities. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Holy Quran, وَثِيَابَكَ فَتَحِّرُ Purify your body. وَثِيَابَكَ 
Your clothing purify it. Fatahir. When we puff, we spoke a lot in detail about the different types of najasat in the chapter of purification. We have najasatun ghalida and najasatun khafifa. We mentioned that there are allowable limits, different allowable limits. For najasatun khafifa, one quarter of the clothing would be allowed for salah. Najasatun ghalida to the size of a dirham, less than the size of a dirham would be allowed. To the size of a dirham or more the size of a dirham of najasatun ghalida will not be allowed to perform salah. So therefore, when we are performing salah, we must remove impurities from our body, clothing and place of salah. Why? These are the things that are going to be affected when we perform the salah. Our clothing, it must be clean from all the different types of najasa that we spoke about. Blood, urine, stool, etc. The, the body also. Our body must be clean. Because remember when we start to perform salah, our clothing is a follower of our bodies. And our bodies are there even though it may be covered, yet still our body must be pure. So our body must be pure, our clothing must be pure, and where we are going to perform salah. Now, where we are going to perform salah, it means that the place actually where our feet will be touching, where our, when we are standing, where the, our hands and our faces and our noses will be touching when we are in sajda, and by extension, where our palms will be touching and our knees will be touching while we are in sajda. These are the places that we have to be concerned about with regards to taharat. If we are performing salah, for example, Mawlana Shafari Tanbi Rahmatullahi Alayhi gives the example of a person performing salah, the child urinates. The, urinate, the, the, the urine runs in between him. Eh? The, the person is performing salah, a little child comes, or any, any child, as a matter of fact, and now, the child urinates on the ground. But where he is touching for his salah is not affected with the urine. Then the salah will be valid because he is not touching any najasat. The najasat being wrong with regards to our smelling it or our seeing it, a person may become uncomfortable. But that does not prevent the correctness of the salah. So when we speak about purification, my dear respected brothers and sisters, of the body, clothing and place, it means that which is directly affected or attached to us whilst we are performing salah and we will continue from there next day inshallah. Right? We will continue from there next day and there are a, a few more explanations inshallah with regards to that. Um, the last day it was asked on the topic of adhan with regards to the as salatu khayru min al -nawm. If a person leaves it out. Right? With the hawala of Ahsan al Fatawa and Fatawa Rahimiya, it is mentioned that if a person leaves off a salatu khayru min an naum and they have already completed the adhan, if they are in the same majlis, a, they are right there, then they can just say back, as we mentioned, Alhamdulillah, as salatu khayru min an naum, as salatu khayru min an naum, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, la ilaha illallah until the end. If they are saying Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, they can stop saying the Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, and then pulling back as salatu khayrum min al naum, as salatu khayrum min al naum until the end. And if they did not, they forgot about it totally, and they went away and they even performed their sunnah of fajr, no problem, they can leave it like that. You don't have to repeat the adhan in that particular instance, inshallah. Khair? Any other questions, inshallah? The question, the question is a person has already performed the witr salah because they didn't think that they would wake up for tahajjud salah, more or less. And then they woke up for the tahajjud salah. Do they have to repeat the witr salah? No. According to the Hanafi jurist, oh, salah, salat al-witr is only performed once. And nothing nullifies the salat al-witr except what we mentioned before, that if we perform the witr salah remembering that and knowing we didn't perform the Isha Salah yet. That obliterates our Witr Salah. We will have to perform it again in that case. But in this particular case, as long as the person has already performed the Witr Salah, no problem. Wake up and perform Tahajjud Salah, inshallah. 
and it will not be affected. Right? According to the Hanafi jurists, inshallah. The question is, a person misses salah, can they perform it when the next salah time comes in, or do they have to perform it the next day for that particular salah time? Right? So, for example, like Dohar. Right? So, a person misses the Dohar salah. Dohar and now Asr salah comes in. So, when they have to make qadha of it, as long as it is not the actual makru time of the sun being set, they can perform the qadha of, they can perform the qadha of Dohar. They don't have to wait until the next day of Dohar in order to perform that. Right? We will touch a little bit more on that. There are two types of people. One person who is known as Sahib al Tartib, a person who has never who has never missed more than five, six salah in his life, or according to some scholars, he has missed it, but made up for all of them. If a person like that misses a salah, it's not permissible even for that person to perform the other salah until he performs that salah. Then he will perform the salah of the timing. Right? But Briefly to answer the question, the person can perform it in the time after the salah or the next day. So we'll touch a little bit more on qadha salah inshallah in the next session. Jazakumullah. Oh,